And welcoming to the Sexy Aging Podcast, I have the pleasure of introducing Anne-Marie McQueen from Hot Flash Inc. Now, that, if that doesn't grab you, uh, then you're dead. <laughs> so <laughs> you need to check her out. Um, she has a newsletter and a podcast to inform, educate, and entertain. And I'm just going to put my hand up and say I am highly entertained by your style of communication around this time of our lives and predominantly you know we're talking about menopause you and I um, but there are a couple of things that I'm super impressed by before I um, let you speak and take the floor Anne-Marie your TikTok account is banging girl <laughs> oh thank you <laughs> it's brilliant I... absolutely brilliant it's exactly the type of humor that I really enjoy if I want to get a bit of a laugh out of our situation I'll just go check out hot flash and tiktok account so there thank you <laughs> thank you I made one thing setting out I there's a lot of humor I didn't like like there's a lot of humor I don't like in the menopause space I don't find it funny it's like entertainment you know like oh yeah I, and I and I see women with larger accounts and more followings doing like a video of like chuck plucking chin hair or um, making fun of their bodies or, and like, I've just, I didn't like that in my life when I, in journalism, when I was writing about wellness and body image for the last 20 years, I, I did, I didn't like it. And I realized that a lot of points in my career as a columnist, I was doing it. And so I just don't like it. So sometimes I see someone blowing up on TikTok and they're doing all that. And then I think, oh, should I be doing it? And then I'm like, no, no, I'm just going to do what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. Keep doing what you're doing. Cause it is really, really cool. And you don't leave us feeling worse about the situation. And, and lots of times I'm really, you know, we're educated and there are a lot of things that you say and that you bring to the forefront oh, where women need to know something, but you do it in such a highly entertaining way. And it's, um, it's light, you know, we need this. We need this lightness. <laughs> <laughs> we yeah, do, yeah. <laughs> we do. Um, so you are a journalist and you're in Abu Dhabi. Uh, how does that work? <laughs> how did you get, how did that happen? Okay, that's so funny. I've been thinking about this a lot lately because I've been here for 13 years and when you've been someplace for that long and I might be coming up to a change, it's like, how did this happen? But I, I've been a journalist since I was in my 20s and I worked in Canada for about, uh, I guess from 2006 to, uh, or sorry, 1996 to 2008 when I left. And I sort of worked my way up the way you do in like the small town newspaper all the way up to the, I was working in the capital, the Ottawa Sun. And I had a great job. I was a features editor and I was the, um, like the columnist for the paper. And, but it, I just felt like something was, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. Right. I just felt like there was something else that I wanted to do, but I didn't know what it was. So I bought a house and decorated it and that didn't work. And then I thought probably like you know, I was like 37. Okay. Probably I just want to get married because everyone's getting married and having kids, but that wasn't happening. And then this, so it's sort of like noodling around and found this newspaper they were launching in the, in the United Arab Emirates, the Sheikh wanted to have a newspaper and he was hiring like all these great journalists from around the world. And this editor who I really admired from England and I just applied and then the ball got rolling. And then before I knew it, I had packed up everything and sold everything. And I had five suitcases and I was landing in Abu Dhabi where I'd never been. <laughs> so, <laughs> love, it, love it. Which seems crazy now, because when I think about going somewhere else, I mean, I love living here, but if I ever think about going somewhere else, it seems like such a big deal. Um, and then of course it just changed me in so many ways. And I think what people don't realize about the Middle East is that it really is the middle of the world. So you're just surrounded by so many different nationalities. So it's almost like moving to the international place yeah. of the world. And so that's just been mind expanding and like just my soul and all of it. It's been really, you know, it's what I was supposed to do. So that's how I ended up here. Everyone always wonders. And it works so fine because I'm a freelancer now. So yeah, no, it's brilliant. And so how did you get started with Hot Flashing? So it started originally as a blog site or a newsletter or yeah. How I did started it as a newsletter. Yeah, I started it as a newsletter. Um, I, you know, I was, um, I went into, I was the features editor at the, the, the national. I worked there for nine years and I had experience with having content right on the website and trying to make money from that. Then I was hired to launch, a, a, I, I, I edited a healthy living website called Live Healthy. And, you know, just having all the free content posted on there, I just wasn't sure about that model and sort of having to go after the Google ads and everything. So I thought I'll just start with a newsletter. And what's got me started was I had just a hell 40s, you know, starting from <laughs> early 40s 
just like the story you hear over and over and over, just not knowing what was going on in the ER for chest pain, in, in, at the naturopath, at the integrative physician, at the therapist's office, having panic attacks, having even suicidal thoughts, yeah. um, just very unwell, you know, like at one point I had adrenal exhaustion and then I got better from that and still doing the things that I did when I was younger to sort of cope with stress, which was exercising like crazy and probably drinking too much. And alcohol. going out. Uh, yeah. Partying at the other going end. out, yeah. going, you know, yeah. doing the healthy thing with your friends, you think. Um, and then just going to be just going 90 miles an hour and just having a really, 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 really hard time. So around 48, I had a personal crash. I, a, a couple of things happened in my life and I missed my first period that I can remember. And, and so even though I had known about menopause, like, I think when I was 45, I read, uh, Christian Northrup's Women's Bodies, Women's Wisdoms, the chapter on menopause. And I read it and I was like, oh, that seems kind of positive because she's very positive about it. And I was like, okay, I'll be ready when that comes, you know, 10 years down the road. And then when I think when I missed, like I definitely missed a period and there was no other explanation for it. I think I'd missed a couple, but you know, international travel can always screw up, but there was always a reason why, or, you know, right. I broke up with my boyfriend or just something. This was like no reason to miss a period. And then I Googled and then I was like, okay, perimenopause. And once I started, like once I realized and admitted to myself, that's what was going on. It was a hundred times better because I started learning and researching, but at the same time, I just really didn't like the content that I was finding because yeah. I'm obsessed yeah. with producing content. I, I like, I would always say once, once I became an editor, I'd say like cast a really wide net, go deep. I don't like, I hate this superficial stuff. There's certain styles I hate. I like it to be positive, but weighty. Um, and all I was finding then, I guess this is almost four years ago, was a lot of content that's just arranged around selling something. So whether yeah. it's a coach or a, a therapist or a, a mainstream with a product embedded in it that you don't really know about. You just know you're reading kind of a crappy article. And even then I noticed the polarization. I noticed that it was like HRT on one side, natural on the other, and they were already fighting and everyone was really defensive. So yeah, that's I, when I, actually I just really like this conversation and I've never had this with anyone before. So let's park that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. We'll come back. I mean, yeah, I could we'll, talk about that all day. To... Yeah. Great. Yeah. But you know, they say, wait, a lot of people say I just couldn't find what I wanted. So I did it myself and whether that ends up being anything more than a passion project, but I really just wanted to, and now, even now I'm like, Oh, if I could do that, if I could do that, I'll sponsor a spot, a really good science writer. And I'll be like, if I could just hire her and get it, you know? So that's just why just, and then I didn't bargain for connecting with all these amazing women from around the world. I knew because of where I was, I wanted it to be global, which is a lot, but um, that's sort of given me this cool bird's eye view and then everything else has just been really cool from it, you know? Yeah, that's amazing. So the newsletter's been running for four years and you recently launched- No, just a year and a half. I finally oh. got around to doing it in the pandemic. Yeah, I just did it in like yeah. June 20, June 2020. And then the podcast was last fall and, you know, things kind of happen as they're supposed to, I guess, because I had connected with a couple of brands and one of them was like, we will sponsor your podcast. So I had been thinking of doing a podcast and then had a brand that helped me launch it, which is, I think, really cool. Like I hadn't been ready for yeah, that. So that is so cool yeah. because, you know, that's it's actually not very common so in the podcasting <laughs> world just let me sort of explain to any listeners um if you've ever thought about doing a podcast so you've actually got to dig deep and know that this could probably be from a point of passion that's really where it comes from right for most people that start a podcast they have something you want to talk about um they want to talk to other people they also want to talk about it and therefore you just start getting the ball rolling and it takes a really long time before a podcast would actually get some level of sponsorship um so congratulations yeah. because i think you've kind of hit the bullseye when it comes to women's midlife health and the fact that mm -hmm. there are other brands out there that really want to help and integrate um, their conversations to obviously help women um so congratulations kicked it out of the park i listened to your podcast well, it's fantastic thank you i mean i'm not making rich but the, i'm not getting rich from it but i was able to get an editor because i have never i know how to edit but i have never had any patience for it myself so it's yeah. nice to have just pass it over to sonia she's a radio announcer here and i think what 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 they like is that i am I, I am in the middle and i'm just asking questions and i don't really have an agenda i'm also trying to figure out things myself should i go on hormone therapy i'm just trying yeah. to be really thoughtful about it so, you know, I think there's just way too many people telling you what you should do and making you feel weird if you haven't done it and getting mad at each other. And <laughs> we are in a time where it's really hard to ask questions, you know, like I made um, a video and I wrote about that this weekend, like 
even just asking questions has become sort of like a radioactive thing in a lot of spaces. So yeah, it's harder than I thought. I got to tell you, it's harder. It's never been easy to be a journalist. You, you live in fear every time you write a, a tricky story that it's going to be um, the one that will, you know, I don't know what, or you're going to make a mistake that will be career ending. That's a constant, you know, it's a, it's a constant, but this interacting on social media and, and being it just me is it's like, I'm not complaining, but it's a lot harder than I thought. It's been a lot. It's been, it's really helped me grow because it's, it's scary. Like I've had yeah. to find some courage, <laughs> more, yeah, well, more courage. Well, now you're on the other side because I'm interviewing you and, <laughs> and, you know, I want to interview you a little bit more around your menopause story. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm going to keep it light and positive because that's, okay. you know, the way we do things. Favorite symptom. <laughs> Favorite symptom. Yeah. Oh, I always, I think it's really weird uh, when I get like tingling. Oh, like I get tingling on my body. Yeah. Um, but you know what my favorite symptom is, is just the change that's happened in me. Okay. What I always say after I read that chapter by Christian Northrup, I, I thought this is going somewhere good. And any woman you speak to who's through it, unless they're sort of a dysfunctional type person, <laughs> uh, is really happy. You know, they're very yeah. content and, and most of the time, and I just confirm when I speak to older women, Although there's a, 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 a fun expat community here and I, yeah. I speak to them. So my, uh, my favorite symptom is just like the growing into myself, like becoming more confident, being, feeling, feeling strength in my intelligence and being able to express it and feeling, con like feeling confidence in my views that have always been different, but I felt were wrong because other people didn't always agree with me. And I always feel like the wrong person. And I, I was just driving back from Dubai yesterday and I thought, you know, I've always thought differently. And I've tried to talk to other people and see if it was okay for years. And it, and it's not because most people, you know, most people, like I'm not married. I haven't had kids at this age, just becoming myself, just becoming myself and going, okay, like all of this makes sense. You didn't do the obvious thing, but it's okay. You know, yeah. that is my favorite symptom. That's, yeah. I don't know what that is. I call it as it's, this is a soul journey as well as like a mm. bunch of symptoms. And so that's another reason I got into it because I feel like that gets lost yeah. in all the symptoms. Definitely. I gotta, I gotta agree with you. I think my bullshit odometer has heightened. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, I can just read right through it and I get to make decisions a lot quicker. Um, from a from a gut instinct to call it that and obviously an intelligence perspective obviously you know having experience life experience and I think that's one of the coolest things about where we stand today is that despite all the challenging physical symptoms that you go through with perimenopause mentally when you can ditch the brain fog and you know you know maybe some low level anxiety or whatever that is because it's different for everyone when you get mm. through that and you realize you made it and now life is awesome and you've got less living than you've had, it just changes everything, doesn't it? Yeah. And I think there's a lot more peace of mind. Like I did a lot of work around 48 because like I said, I had a life crash, a bunch of things happened and I had, I guess the closest thing you would have to a breakdown. So I've done a lot of work on like those adverse childhood experiences that can make, we know from research can make menopause wor worse. But when I say like, I think I've always had these, these feelings about people in situations, but I've overridden them because yeah. they didn't make sense. Right. Like, you know, you have someone in front of you who seems awesome. And why are you questioning? Because, you know, why are, you know, you should be, or you have a situation that seems awesome. You should be grateful. You should accept it. And so it's almost like a fog clears a little bit and you're like, Oh, I had the right impressions all mm. along. I just didn't along. listen to myself. So that's like, that's where I just feel a, a big lifting of a bunch of stuff in my head. Cause it's like, it doesn't matter what, what, it doesn't matter if it doesn't make sense. This person in this situation doesn't feel right to me. So I'm going to take like my time. I'm not going to enter it. Yeah. Fantastic. I love that so much. Um, let's get to that uh, post-it note that I pinned on the wall, the HRT versus the natural direction. So mm -hmm. I, I, um, I sit with you <laughs> on this discussion um, and I was part of a podcast interview with for somebody else where we talked about something that I termed midlife shaming um, and I only kind of gave it that name because I felt that I had publicly 
blogged about my experience in trying to navigate my way through perimenopause. I did come to the decision that I would take HRT and I got massive backlash about it. And I was actually like really shocked. I'm like, but I'm an intelligent person. I know my body. I've been in the fitness industry for 30 years Mm -hmm. and I know Mm -hmm. about science and actually this is working for me. And I know that people don't want to do that and that all the other natural things that I've tried, some of them are really great as well. But I was just thinking, okay, this is just the icing on the cake and let me know what I don't know already. But obviously it worked out for me. But what I was really concerned about was just the backlash and just like, why would anybody question me looking after myself? No. So yeah, no. very interesting discussion going on right now. In very, the, in the... <laughs> very interesting. And you get the same when you ask questions about hormone therapy from people who are obsessed with hormone therapy. Why aren't you on hormone therapy? What did yeah. I say the other day? I said, oh, one thing I'm really curious about is progesterone, which no one ever talks about. Oh, yeah. And some doctors say you should try progesterone first, maybe because estrogen can, when you go off of it later, it's it's got sort of addictive qualities. So you can have a reverb <laughs> of your symptoms down the road. And a lot of women don't know that. And a woman wrote to me, well, we, we stay on it forever. And I was like, okay, okay, fine. Like that is one solution, you know, like whatever (laughs) the tone I get. And some from some very prominent doctors is I'll test sometimes on Twitter, just asking, and they'll just come in. Yeah. It's like hormone therapy is the answer. And then what you got, which is like, it's, uh, it's, you're going to give you cancer and it's going to give you whatever. It's very hard to know. Um, it's very hard to cut through all this, but the science is there. It is much safer. That stuff is all clear. I think there's other reasons to question it. And, and I think, you know, just not wanting to have a prescription every day in a part of the world where I don't know if I can get it. Um, I had an experience, you know, from January to, to August, I was suffering last year so incredibly with fat- fatigue, um, body pain, bloating, and like depressive. Like, and I mean fatigue, I mean like three days of like, I had to lay down and work. Like fatigue, like I've never experienced. Sleepy fatigue. And I was like, okay, I've got to go on hormone therapy. I talked to a functional guy that I know. He said, I'll help you. And then I just happened to go to a gastroenterologist to get a colonoscopy, which I still have not had. And I, he said, how do you, how is your, you know, and I told him, he said, it sounds to me like you have SIBO. Yeah. Let's do the test for SIBO, small bacterial intestinal yeah. overgrowth. Some people still think this is controversial. It's new. It mm-hmm. hasn't been around for very many years. Mm-hmm. I did the test. I have every, I have it. It's a very infuriating gut issue that I've done one round of things to fix. I'm now doing another round. It might take another six months. I've got to change everything. My point in bringing it up is um, if I had taken, um, like I had some very pronounced symptoms, but they, they could be perimenopause, but they were something else. Mm. So if I had taken the hormone therapy and not addressed the SIBO, I would, the SIBO, which is screwing with my blood sugars, which is leading to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It's creating a situation in my body that's not great, right? As the doctor said, you're creating toxic chemicals when you eat. It it was giving me a sore throat. I had to go to an ENT. I sound like a mess. I'm really not. But, you know, (laughs) I'm getting to the bottom of You're aware. You're aware of your body right now. Yeah. Yeah. My concern is if I had put hormone therapy on top of that, well, well, I probably would have felt better, but I never would have fixed the root issue. And just this week, I came across a study about sleep apnea and it was um, some researchers and it, I think they were in Japan or Korea and they were, I wrote about two studies this week, so I'm screwing them up of where they were, but they, they, they were looking at, um, they were looking at joint pain and fatigue. And what they concluded was that in, in, in menopausal women, and what they concluded was that a lot of the problem is sleep apnea, which our incidence of sleep apnea grows through the entire transition. Correct. And, and a lot of times the researchers said those symptoms present as perimenopause and menopause symptoms. We know even morning headaches, which is a sign of sleep apnea. So they, they said to people, if you're having these symptoms, go get tested, go get a sleep test or a breathing sleep test. Because I mean, the, the risk factors for sleep apnea, hypertension, diabetes, and ultimately cardiovascular disease. That was another example to me that, you know, really taking hormone therapy in that situation would probably also make you feel better, but wouldn't you like to know that you you have sleep apnea? You've the real problem. Yeah. Right. And then your, your risk, you know, we hear all the time, the big three osteoporosis, um, dementia and uh, cardiovascular disease, Mm -hmm. but my concern about, and I sound like I'm down on hormone therapy. I'm not, but my concern about going on hormone therapy 
But now we're being told just to reduce your risk of those things is that to not find the underlying problems that you may be having, which I think you need to do. And, um, you know, just, just doing it and maybe not feeling better, you know, maybe not feeling that much better. And yeah. you see this on social media all the time, women yeah. going on and on and on about their hormone therapy and how this didn't work. And they went back and got this. And I do think there's doctors that are just putting them on it and then tinkering with it. And no one's ever getting to the root cause. So this stuff is all really expensive. And I, I know it requires a certain amount of like a lot of privilege to be able to get to the bottom of your um, medical issues. It's expensive, but I just feel like that gets, that gets lost in the conversation. Yeah, no, it's super important. Um, tomorrow I've got a podcast episode actually coming out. It's International Women's Day tomorrow. And I've spoken with a prominent doctor here in New Zealand who specializes in menopause women's health. Now she's only 35 which is oh. absolutely awesome. So she is like going gung-ho. This is what she wants to do is help midlife women figure out their health challenges. Now, while she knows everything about menopause and she understands the pharmaceutical upsides, she is focused on finding out the root cause of every other thing that's going on. So she won't instantly go to, oh, here, just put on this patch and get a, you know, IUS. <laughs> So that, yeah. there are some really, really good doctors out there, but they're kind of far yeah, and few between. And you've got to like talk to a friend who knows a friend who knows a friend who knows a friend to find out, you know, these that there are like gold doctors, gold standard that look at all the aspects of your life because it's yeah. it's not just perimenopause. It's like, there's a lot of stuff going on, right? <laughs> right. And I, you know, I think ultimately I'll be probably like you. I do think I will go on it, but I'm still in perimenopause. I don't feel... A rush and I the other thing is when I when I manage my life really well and I manage all the lifestyle and the sleep and no alcohol and the thing and no sugar and what people don't like to do yeah. it is a hundred times better a hundred and when I've got when I'm doing the diet for because Siebel requires this ridiculous diet yeah. and when I'm doing it perfect which is very hard to follow but when I'm doing it perfectly I, I am so much better and when I test it I'm not so um like, yeah, I'm still in the middle. I don't know. I'm, I'm curious though. And I think probably ultimately, at least when I finish menopause, I'll, I'll go on it. I yeah. think I probably, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you, if you wake up the way I said, if it, like five out of seven days, if you're managing your symptoms and you feel yes. like you can achieve what you want to achieve in the world, then you're probably doing great, you know? Right. Yeah. Right. But there's a lot of noise coming at you either side and yeah. those natural, I call them HRT Helens and natural Nellies. And those natural Nellies are so, I mean, I work in the wellness world here in, um, in the Middle East. And I, you know, some of those people are really intolerable. They're very self-righteous <laughs> and judgmental and they get, they earn their reputation. Honestly, not all of them, but a lot, you know, and social media just torques it up. So it's, I don't envy you being on the receiving end of that. <laughs> well, it didn't, you know what, it was really interesting. Cause I think one of the cool things about being the age that I am, and I want to talk about that coming up, um, was that I was not offended by the mm. response. I was like, oh, okay, all right. So mm -hmm. I've, you know, pricked a thorn in someone or I've tapped into something that's that's kind of made someone recoil and respond really strongly to, you know, what I had written. It was my experience. So I didn't feel that they had a right to question that. So, but it was really interesting how forthright they were. Like, you're a fitness person you should know what you need to do <laughs> I was like yeah but I'm also not stupid I, I can yeah 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 I yeah, can investigate yeah. the science and I can talk to the experts and that's probably one of the most enjoyable things of uh you know being in a podcast as well is like you get to talk to these people and Ooh, work yeah. it out right balance it out yeah. so aging um I ha I do recoil Whenever I see the word, I see it less so now. And maybe it's because I've gone down the rabbit hole of menopause. I don't see the crazy shit that I used to see all the time on social media. But the anti-aging word, there's something about that word that just makes me want to vomit. Mm -hmm. Talk mm -hmm. about your experience. I mean, being a journalist, obviously, you kind of swing between, you know, this word that banters around to sell lots of products to women so that they feel and look younger. I just... I'm trying not to swear, hate the word so much. Pro-aging, yeah. healthy aging. Healthy aging for me is 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 where it's at. Um, how do you feel about it? What's your yeah, opinion? that movement. The the movement of healthy aging, I love. And and I just feel like we're so lucky to be at this time 
where there's just so many different, like I follow Fly Ageless. It's a great social media account. The Ageist is a great website. It's a guy out of LA. Just, just collecting the fact that we have all this wisdom. If we've taken pretty good care of ourselves, we continue to take good care of ourselves. This is the best time. And we know it. We don't have to you know, like we can, we can just genuinely not envy someone who's 30 because we've been there and we know what they've been through. And we can also try not to chase youth because that is sort of a really sad place to be in because you're in a place of lack. You're chasing something you don't have anymore. It's impossible rather than just sort of relaxing into the place that you are. And I, I I feel like the more I do that, the more comfortable I am with myself, but anti-aging, you know, cause you know, I've been over, I've overseen a lot of beauty coverage. I've, I, I've never been very interested in it, to be honest. And I've never been very sold on it. And that sounds crazy because I've w- worked for magazines and, you yeah. know, and we know <laughs> how I'm we've all this skincare. <laughs> and I'm also, obs- I'm very interested in how obsessed people are with skincare and skincare articles and skincare regime and all the companies that are launching in this big gold rush for menopause. So many of them are to do with skin and hair. And to me, it's just reflexive of our obsession with sort of the surface and our ignoring of what's deeper. Mm. And, you know, I don't honestly believe I've tried so many products. I don't honestly believe that it makes much of a difference. I really don't. And that's not going to be, you know, one thing I love is like lasers. You know, we get those age spots, get those mm. lasers going, um, peels, like those things are really cool things, you know, cause it's no fun yeah. to have, like, I'm getting, I have to go, you know, like I've had too much sun. Yeah, those same. things are great, you know? And, um, you know, I'm not going to judge anyone who does anything else, but I don't feel like it does that much. You're yeah. re- And I, that's a controversial to say, but I've tried so many things. And I heard Bobby Brown, she's one of my favorite, Bobby Brown is one of my favorite people because I interviewed her, you know, she has the makeup empire and now she has a new company called Jones Road Beauty. And I interviewed her years ago when she was turning 50 and I was like 35 or something. I'll just tell this little quick story about why I love her so much. And I, and she's, I said, yo, you're turning 50. Like, why do you feel about it? And she said, oh, Emery, how old are you? And I said, I'm 35. She said, you are going to love it. Everything you're worrying about now, everything. She basically like foretold my life now. And I almost like a cry when I think about it. And I want to thank her. But I heard her on a podcast, um, a beauty podcast, and they were saying, what products do you use? And she couldn't have sounded less interested. And you've seen her. She looks great. She's 60. She looks fantastic. She's beautiful. Yeah. She, She could not have sounded like she sounded like me when someone just bored. She just didn't care to, about the question. She was like, oh, she said, it doesn't matter. It's what you put in your body that matters. And I just feel that that is so important. Yeah. And when I see people obsessing about skincare and doing things over here that don't make you sort of glow from the inside out, mm. uh, sorry, that was long winded, but obviously I feel really passionate about it. And I sometimes think, well, what if you get a chance to work with brands about skincare, yeah. you're going to screw yourself by saying this, but it's nice to have nice creams. There are yeah. serums that can work, but Yeah. That's how I feel about it. And I I feel people are chasing, chasing youth. Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, ultimately we, we do need to keep our skin hydrated. I mean, that's the point with perimenopause because you lose the hydration and your skin thins and everything. So it is good to have something that's going to support that obviously an SPF. And so there are brands that, you know, we, we actually, we're going to need it because, um, you know, I live in like an environment that's got extreme weather conditions and mm-hmm. like you I lived in um yes you know I lived in Asia for 20 years so like I just oh. I've had to change my skin regime just because everything goes a bit AWOL, AWOL when you change countries so you know like I'm the same I don't I don't think I'm going to advocate particularly for a particular brand but I wouldn't say no if I felt that something served me on a daily basis I think cool but I won't yep. buy anything that has the word anti-aging and I question people that use it like in marketing and I will call them out (laughs) and just go yeah this is just wrong this is wrong I am curious yeah yeah Yeah. I'm curious about new ingredients and I have noticed in my career the swing from uh chemicals being the thing to now people realizing that most chemicals were created from plants and so plants are very powerful I find that very interesting like I've seen that you know I've seen that people rolling their eyes because I went and got an organic facial you know yeah and then now it's all that And I will say one of the symptoms that I've been having for weeks and weeks and weeks now is just really, really itchy here. Like, oh yeah, yeah. I've got uh, it here. You can see it. Yeah. And it's there. Yeah. And and then I read that that's your estrogen receptors. And it also, I I do think it looks older and more wrinkly and drier there. So 
I actually bought, I was at the Dubai Expo and I was in like the Ghana, the Ghana pavilion and I bought shea butter from there and I've just been like, yeah, like putting it on because yeah, oh, so I, nice. feel like there's, I feel like there's a laser pointed at like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Oh, we've, I've definitely got that same itchiness going on in it. Weird, right? It flares up if I go out in the sun and there's the irony because I need vitamin D, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> could go on and yeah. on. Hey, yeah. um, it's been so, so good to talk to you, Emery, because, you know, you do your own podcast, so you never really get to tell your story. So I just That's feel nice. honored that you've come on my podcast <laughs> and we have opened up and shared a little bit more about Emery McQueen from Hot Flash Inc. Awesome to have you here. Thank you.